Last week, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, announced yet another delay to the world's flagship project to prove the viability of fusion energy and an additional 5 billion euros in extra costs. ITER will now not achieve first operation until 2034, almost a decade later than previously planned and some 50 years after the project was first conceived in 1987. I had a bunch of you guys post comments on past videos of mine following this announcement, kind of decrying the use of all of this funding on this one project and asking the question should we really keep funding it when there are so many other approaches out there but also so many other problems to solve. Is ETA dead? My initial gut reaction to this was of course no we should keep funding it. Science is good and many nations coming together to fund science even better. But if you actually step back and think about it, it is kind of a dumb idea. But before you put me on a rocket and shoot me into the sun to get first-hand experience of the beauty of fusion, I'm a physicist by background. When I'm not on YouTube, I help scientific teams to launch discoveries out of the lab and I help investors back the best scientific teams and breakthroughs that I think can help society. I care about science, but I care even more about making it useful, reliably and quickly. So I want to examine this topic with that hat on. If our goal is to get as fast as possible to fusion, is ITER still the best way to do it? ITER has five primary goals. Number one, achieve a deuterium tritium plasma in which the fusion conditions are sustained mostly by internal fusion heating. This is the self-sustaining fusion reactor we've all been waiting for, though ITER isn't necessarily going to generate any electricity. It's a science and research facility to prove that we can in fact make fusion happen. Goal number two is to achieve a tenfold return on power input into the reactor. With 50 megawatts into ITER, it aims to achieve 500 megawatts out. That's a Q factor of 10. And beyond that, it aims to demonstrate full-scale fusion operation and test different reactor components for fusion, validate whether tritium, a very rare component of the fuel for fusion, can actually be produced in a reactor, and demonstrate the safety of fusion operation and act as a kind of general safe house of fusion know-how. That is why, in 1987, the EU, the UK, Japan, the USA, Russia, later also India, China, and South Korea, teamed up to try and build the biggest fusion reactor in the world. But why the biggest? When you are trying to achieve sustained fusion, you are dealing with two competing factors, the heat generation by the plasma to sustain the fusion reaction versus the heat lost to the environment. Obviously, ideally, you want more energy generated than lost, so you can use some of that heat and turn it into electricity by powering, yes, a steam engine, it's always a steam engine. This becomes easier the bigger the reactor because heat produced scales proportionally to volume, which scales according to the radius cubed, whereas heat lost scales with the surface area, which scales according to to R squared. That means a reactor twice as big contains eight times as much plasma fusion and generates eight times as much heat energy, but the surface area in heat lost is only four times as large. So a bigger reactor overall becomes more efficient, and so very naturally we all find ourselves shouting the same thing. Moonshot. I'm about to go to the moon. Unfortunately, 36 years on from the ambitious plans set out by the governments around the world, far from breaking records by burning plasma at temperatures 10 times hotter than the center of the sun, ITER instead is about to break records for budget overruns and schedule delays. ITER is spread over many countries, partners, and many independent service companies within those countries. It's a confusing, monolithic, but also dispersed body of activity. In theory, this is good because it pump primes expertise around the world in various fusion capabilities, but in reality, it's an invitation for a really complicated cat herding exercise. Over the decades, ITER has been plagued by a string of holdups, cost overruns, and management issues. The original completion date for the first plasma operation was 2016. Now it's 2034. The involvement of multiple parties with different manufacturing practices, standards, and quality has led to the magnets, the vacuum vessels, the cryostats, the blanket models, Modules, the diverter components, the diagnostic systems, the cooling apparatus, and various electrical components, all needing reordering, repurchasing, and replacing. The decision-making process within ITER itself often requires consensus among all member countries, making it incredibly slow and complex, and making controlling the direction and capability of ITER about as effective as paddling the Titanic with a pool noodle. May I interest you in a pool noodle? As a result, there have been several changes in the leadership of ITER as it searched for an effective management style and strategy, 
The fact is, there probably isn't one. This organizational complexity is an added burden to maybe the most complex project that humanity has ever undertaken. Although the ETA project formally began in 2006 with an estimated $6.3 billion price tag, it's now somewhere in the region of $22 to $27 billion. I couldn't quite get a straight answer on whether this includes the additional 5 billion euros or not, which is now scheduled for its first operation in 2034. Our question still is, does it make sense to keep pushing forward here or is ETA dead? I want to put that in context relative to the amount of money that private fusion companies around the world have raised. But before I do that, I need to thank today's sponsor for making this episode possible, Akiflow. Building the largest fusion reactor is an incredibly challenging task. It's at least twice as hard as running a YouTube channel, which is why I use Akiflow, a productivity app for people who want to be better time managers, to make sure I don't go over my budget by several billions of dollars. Unlike some other applications, Akiflow uses a calendar system to organize all your tasks, events, and blocks. If I create a new task here with a personalized keyboard shortcut, let's say scripting a story, I can insert it directly into the calendar just like that. When I'm researching, one of my favorite features is I can create a task straight from the clipboard, meaning I don't need to skip a beat when I'm reading through a document. After that, it's all contained in a to-do list, which you can prioritize and insert into your calendar. This way I can combine tasks, events, and time blocks all into one place. That's really the appeal of Akiflow to me. It brings everything together in one place. In fact, you can also integrate all of these other apps too. If you are thinking of starting your own creative projects like a YouTube channel or something a bit more simple like building a fusion reactor, check Check out Akiflow in the link down below in the description. Now let's get back to the video. Let's put some things in context. From the numbers that I could find, the more than 35 private companies developing fusion approaches around the world have collectively raised $2.4 billion from private investment and $3.8 billion from public and government funding, which brings the total investment in private fusion to just over $6.2 billion, $100 million less than the starting cost of ITER at $6.3 billion. I've been really lucky to visit some of these teams working on fusion around the world, and one of the things that always strikes me is the diversity of approaches under development. From tokamak approaches like ITA to stellarators, inertial confinement approaches, whether they're laser-based or projectile-based, there are a lot of viable ways fusion may be realized in the next 10 years. We've definitely learned things from ITA, or at least maybe learned things not to do, but nothing much yet about the fusion plasma ITA was designed to study in the first place. I wonder what the ITA funding directed into a diversified approach would have achieved by now because ultimately we still don't really know which route to fusion will actually work best. This is somewhat analogous to large nuclear fission reactors. We can in theory build them, but governments around the world often hesitate to actually go through with it for a whole bunch of regulatory safety and other reasons. Maybe small nuclear reactors or micronuclear reactors like we've covered on this channel before will actually prove out to be the better approach to nuclear fission. If we take a quantum inspired analogy, I'd rather humanity be in a superposition of all possible fusion approaches advancing towards the end point and then collapse the wave function and find out which one actually works rather than a most of our eggs in one basket approach. Homie, it looks like you're putting all your eggs in one basket. What would you have me do? One basket for each egg? Hmm, I guess you're right. I guess I'll have to scratch that off the list of things I say. And what you might be saying here is that, okay, but sometimes you just have to fund big science projects. Think of CERN, the LHC, or JWST. Those worked out and ultimately became operational, though oftentimes experienced similar teething troubles. The JWST was intended to be completed in a decade at a cost of around $1 billion. In the end, it took about 20 years and about $10 billion to get the telescope off the ground. Obviously, this is unfortunate for astronomers waiting to stare deeper into our universe and understand more things, but I think it is different to the problem of solving fusion. JWST is a pure scientific activity to feed our deep curiosity. ETA is supposed to accelerate and de-risk our pathway to fusion, a technology that could provide clean energy for millions around the world and for a planet at a time when we are really starting to notice the effects of things like climate change. Operations beginning in 2034 with full-scale efforts now pushed back to 2039. The question is, is this too late? 
is ITER still able to be useful or will the startups and companies around the world already have had to have faced and answered the questions that ITER was designed to help with by the time the facility is actually operational. The thing about JWST and the LHC is that they are pure scientific learning endeavors that cannot really be easily realized by anything other than large scale collaborations across teams of scientists. Here in Fusion, we have 35 credible teams advancing different approaches faster and for a lower cost than even the initial estimates for ITER. Shouldn't we be supporting them more? What I love about ITER is it's a scientific leap conducted across many nations and organizations. Yes, that may also be one of the things crippling it, but the idea behind it to break up national borders in pursuit of understanding and elevation of human capability is what I want my world leaders to actually be excited about. For me, the Kardashev scale of civilization started a little bit too late on the chain. To make it to a type one civilization able to access all of the energy available on its planet, we first have to be a type zero civilization, one capable of conducting and collaborations across borders to solve some of the most complicated scientific and technical challenges we have ever faced. ITER is a great project because it's a unifying call. ITER is a terrible project because it suffers from all of the typical afflictions of big, bulky, hard to manage innovation activity. What I'd like to see is the nations of the world instead collaborating to develop a program targeted at backing a early and diverse set of solutions to our planet's problems, sharing in those outcomes, and ultimately collapsing the wave function to see what works best. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. For me, I always try and practice strong opinions held weekly in the face of good evidence or good reasoning. I wanna change my mind. I've simplified a bunch of complicated concepts here also to kind of make the conversation a little bit easier. So feel free to call me out on them and give a little bit more detail. If you would like to follow some more of the work that I do, I'm launching a Patreon soon to help support some of the science teams which I work with and to try and give you some more cool access behind the scenes to interesting science and interesting people. Check that out in the description if you are interested. Thank you as always for watching. I will see you next week. Goodbye.